Hello and welcome to Corpus Cast, part of the Aston Originals family, providing fresh perspectives from Aston University experts. My name is Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language here at Aston University. Now, I'm a corpus linguist, meaning that I study linguistic patterns, trends and variation using large samples of language data. Uh, and so on behalf of the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group, welcome to the show. Uh, Corpus Cast is the show all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. And in this new series, I'll be speaking with top researchers in the field to find out more about how corpus linguistics can be applied to a diverse range of areas, including health, social justice, education, and many others. In this episode of Corpus Cast, our topic is how corpus linguistics contributes to research about health and health communication. In a moment, I'll be speaking to Elena Semino, Professor of Linguistics and Verbal Art at Lancaster University and Director of the ESRC Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Science. Elena has spent years studying how language is used in a range of health topics, including cancer, pain, and most recently, COVID-19, among others. Elena is also very well known for her research into metaphorical language and has published over 50 papers on this topic. In today's episode, we'll discuss her work in corpus linguistics and health communication and the contribution that corpus linguistics can make to this field of applied research. So I'm very pleased to welcome to Corpus Cast Professor Eleanor Semino. Hello, Eleanor. It's great to see you. How are you? Hello, Robbie. Thank you. It's great to see you too. Thank you so much for agreeing to appear on Corpus Cast. Um, I think this will be a really interesting conversation. Um, let's get straight into it then. We'll start with a couple of general questions uh, about, about your work with corpus linguistics. We, we'll try to get across corpus linguistics to our viewers um, in a broad way. What does corpus linguistics mean to you? Um, corpus linguistics for me um, is a way of answering questions about how people use language, how people communicate, that have relevance both to linguists and for people outside linguistics and corpus linguistics. So I wasn't trained as a corpus linguist when I did my PhD. Corpus linguistics was still beginning and there were no modules or courses that I could take. So I picked up corpus linguistics as I went along. Uh, but for me, it was always a really important way in which we could analyze large quantities of linguistic data to understand how people use language to communicate about topics, particularly sensitive topics like in health, so that we could come up with robust uh, findings that might also have broader relevance outside linguistics. So that's that's what it is for me. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, you. You said you didn't receive uh, part of your formal education training in corpus linguistics. So so how how did that happen? Uh, perhaps a little was it a little bit later in your career after after you uh, finished studying formally? Yeah, so I belong to that generation who um, went into linguistics, and my first area was stylistics, the linguistic uh, study of literature, so that I could get away from maths. Um, and then <laughs> okay. I realized that actually uh, in the department where I was studying a PhD in in stylistics, so it was mm -hmm. you know. Uh, the linguistic analysis of literary texts. Uh, there was research going on, Professor Jeffrey Leach, um, who was the pioneer of corpus linguistics at Lancaster, uh, was working uh, with these collections of texts and mm -hmm. people developing software that you could use to interrogate these collections of texts. Um, and so I became interested in the potential of corpus linguistics and uh, I had to overcome my reluctance to interact with numbers, uh, which I think I've more or less got over now. Um, and to begin with, my fir the first questions I used corpus linguistics to answer together with uh, my PhD supervisor, Mick Short, was to look at patterns in narrative that relate to the presentation of the speech and thought of characters. So we, we annotated the corpus and then used corpus linguistics to um, arrive at quantitative patterns. So I came to it via stylistics that I was already interested in. But basically then I picked it up by working with people um, who developed corpus methods uh, rather than via formal instruction because there was no such thing at the time. 
That's really interesting because uh, colleagues uh, of mine here at Aston uh, are also looking at that, that journey from stylistics to what you might call applying ideas and, and theories from stylistics to, to, to other areas as well. So it's interesting to hear so your journey uh, into corpus linguistics. And, and I think it's evident that a lot of your early work in stylistics still informs you know, a lot of your a lot of your work now. Um, of course, as, as, as I mentioned, you're you're known as a leading researcher in the use of corpora for the study of topics related to healthcare and, and health communication. And and, uh, and I think one of one of the early or, or sort of first areas you, you start looking at in this context was was cancer and, and end of life care. Um, this is something you've been working on for quite some time now. I, I traced a paper all the way back to 2004 on this topic. Um, so what, you know, try to summarize your work looking at looking at cancer and, and what can, what has corpus linguistics done to contribute to this area? Because on the surface, people might not necessarily see any connection necessarily between the kind of uh, approaches that you take and applications relating to how people communicate about cancer. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, I started thinking about communication about cancer very early on, um, partly because I was interested in metaphor because of my training in uh, literary linguistics, if you like, I was interested in metaphor. And actually, um, it was already clear in, in uh, the 1990s and the 2000s that metaphor in communication about cancer uh, is particularly important and controversial. So, uh, in, a, in Susan Sontag wrote in the late 1970s, an American sociologist criticizing military language to talk about cancer, war against cancer, battle against cancer. Mm. Uh, so metaphors that drew from source domain, from domains to do with violence and, uh, and uh, battle, etc., and fighting. So I was already interested in applying what I knew about metaphor to uh, communication about cancer. And that paper that you are referring to uh, was actually trying to develop a method for uh, doing that. But it took much longer. And I think this is also something I want to emphasize. It takes a long time to uh, get to where one wants to be. So it took me a long time from that paper that was published in 2004, but was written about four years earlier, <laughs> uh, to get to a point where I had collaborators from the health uh, research side that I could work with. And also colleagues from corpus linguistics and other areas, and uh, the right data and the ability to collect the right data so that I, I could do that work. But in essence, what we did, and eventually we got funded, funded in 2012, so you, you, you know that's, that's the amount of time it took for mm -hmm. that work to take place. We wanted to see, uh, first of all, given that there's a debate about metaphors for cancer, uh, should people talk about battles or not? Um, some people argue that battle metaphors, war metaphors are harmful potentially for patients. And there was already a lot of discussion then. Um, there was also, there had been a decision in the NHS since about 2007, the metaphor of the cancer journey was adopted and, and mm -hmm. fights were not mentioned in policy documents. A cancer journey was. So we wanted to see what metaphors are actually used by people involved in cancer and cancer care? So what metaphors are actually used? And uh, when we discover what metaphors are used, by analyzing how they're used, can we see whether some metaphors are better than others, whether, whether battle metaphors are harmful, whether journey metaphors are better on the basis of linguistic evidence? So to answer those questions, Ideally, you've got to analyze a lot of language use and mm. from more than one group of people. Um, and the reason why it's important to analyze a lot of language use is not just, of course, that the more you analyze, the, the, the better you are in a better position to, to answer questions in, a, in, a, in a, a reliable way, but also that we wanted to communicate with, um, write for, disseminate our results amongst uh, healthcare researchers. And uh, some of the people we wanted to reach are people who are used to uh, quantitative findings as well as qualitative ones. And this is one of the advantages of corpus linguistics in healthcare research, that it can bridge the divide between people who need statistics and numbers uh, 
Mm -hmm. to have faith in results, as well as the people who do the kind of research that's a more qualitative, where you're analyzing in depth and in an interpretative manner, more uh, uh, smaller data sets. So basically, then we built a large data set, a large corpus, including language from patients with cancer, family carers looking after someone with cancer, and healthcare professionals. And we had data from interviews and online forums, mostly for online, from online forums, so that we ended up with one and a half million words. And we found a way that I won't go into now to uh, find metaphors in that data. And then we had answers both to which metaphors do people use and do we have any evidence that some metaphors are better than others. And so basically that is what that project uh, consisted of. Wow, that's, yeah. So interesting and and a, a really you know a brilliant example I suppose of um, a question that can be asked and, and answered only through uh, an in depth study of, of large samples of language. I suppose you already had suspicions about certain metaphors that might be less helpful and others that might be more helpful. Um, what did you in terms of metaphors that perhaps were not so widely used but you identified as being you know, rather than a, a battle or a war, you mentioned journey, for instance, that had already been adopted. Was that sort of one of the more preferable uh, metaphors that you found? Yes. So in terms of frequency, we found that the most frequent metaphors in our data, in all of the sections of the data, were uh, what we call violence metaphors, which include all mm. the wars and the fights and the battles, etc., and then journey metaphors. Uh, there were other metaphors, uh, there were animal metaphors and uh, openness metaphors and uh, sports metaphors, etc. There are many types of metaphors, but those two were the most frequent. Um, but then what we found, which wasn't entirely what we were expecting, mm -hmm. was that on the one hand, yes, we did find evidence that some metaphors uh, that relate to fighting can potentially be harmful. So we found people who said um, things like, I feel such a failure that I'm not winning this battle when they were not getting better, when the cancer was incurable. So we found evidence that when that particular metaphor of fighting the disease is applied in a context where the disease is no longer curable, then the person loses the battle and therefore may feel responsible for it. And that is definitely harmful uh, aspect of those mm -hmm. metaphors. We confirmed that with linguistic uh, evidence. We also found that journey metaphors certainly don't have the same disadvantages uh, and can also have some advantages. Like some people say, um, one person says, my journey may not be smooth, but it makes me look up and take notice of the scenery. So some people use journey metaphors to uh, talk about even the positives of a negative experience, such as appreciating things better mm. once you know, you recalibrate what is important in life and then you, you appreciate the meaningful things more with this idea of the new scenery. So definitely we found that there's a difference between those two very frequent metaphors. And so there's a good reason for not imposing war metaphors on people and, uh, and also evidence that journey metaphors certainly don't do any harm. However, what was less expected was that there is also evidence in our data that some people really um, find meaning and purpose in fighting, in the idea of fighting. So mm -hmm. for some people, it's empowering, especially when the disease can still be treated. And equally, some people hate the idea of a journey. The journey can be a bit of a cliche. Some people hate mm -hmm. it. Um, and some people also use uh, journey metaphors to express frustration, like, you know, how can I navigate this road I never wanted to be on kind of thing. Mm. Um, so in essence, then, we've got both evidence of what should be avoided or treated with great care, but also that really the important difference is what metaphors are empowering or disempowering rather than this type of metaphor as opposed to that. Mm. And so in order to, to, to um, allow for uh, variation across individuals and stages of the disease, we then drew from our data and other sources what we call a metaphor menu for people with cancer, which is a collection of different metaphors. So we have music metaphors and nature metaphors mm. and unwanted visitors, etc., so that 
uh, we acknowledge the fact that the different people or different stages of the illness need different metaphors. And so we provide some inspiration by this menu, some inspiration uh, for people. And the, and the metaphor menu has received quite a lot of attention and, and is being, for example, recommended by Cancer Research UK um, on their website uh, for, for people who might want to have different resources. Wow. That's... In essence, that, that's the whole sort of, in a nutshell, that's the yeah. whole uh, trajectory of that project. Yeah. Wow. So I, 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 when you were talking about how there's evidence of, you know, some people actually do prefer those more violent metaphors, I suppose, if they feel like they have a, a chance of, of uh, more of a chance of surviving, perhaps. So it is, I, I guess, about what you found is that people should be presented a choice as opposed to having a metaphor imposed upon them by uh, by their carers and, and, and health health workers who may you know instinctively talk about cancer as being a battle i mean that's certainly the, th the thing that pops into my head more than anything else people talk about they're in a fight um the metaphor menu though that sounds that sounds brilliant and you said it's been recommended by cancer research uk uh, how did that feel i mean do you have any examples where you've you've heard that this has been used by someone and you know they've come back and said this has been this has really, really helped. I mean, on a personal level, you know, when, when you see an example of something that you've contributed to producing and putting out there in the world based on your research, how does that feel when you, you hear that this is appreciated and that it's made a difference to someone? Yeah, it's great. It's really, it's really rewarding. Um, and there's, a, there's also a personal reason why I did all of this uh, relating to my father dying of cancer when I was very young. So uh, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a, personal sides to it as well not just the professional side mm -hmm. um so yes no it feels if it, it feels uh great and obviously it's not just me doing this research we're a group of colleagues um it is it does feel very uh, rewarding and and i do hear from people on a regular basis who either healthcare professionals who use it or um people you know with cancer who find it and, and find it useful um so so that is very rewarding the thing that is even more um touching is when people it's up it's happening less now but w during the main phase of the project when there were um, media reports about the mm. project sometimes people would write and uh, 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 unsolicited and and offer their their own metaphors oh. or yeah. or send some of their diaries or um, sometimes people would write would send me material written by a, a loved one who had died mm. and so the fact that people sort of entrusted me with very personal uh documents so that something positive might come out of of uh, a very distressing tragic experience in their lives i think that was particularly moving and it um you know i had to always think very hard about you know like you, you write you know dozens of emails a day but uh, i had to think really hard uh about how how to to respond to emails like that mm. um, so yes, no, it's been it's been very personally uh, rewarding. Yes, yeah. Wow, that must be yeah, quite uh, emotional in in some yes, way. Very emotional. Yeah. Messages like yeah. that, and and it means something so personal to you. Um, thank you for sharing that. And uh, we'll, I think we'll, we'll we'll sort of talk in a little bit more broadly about how you mentioned. Obviously, you you've had to spend quite a long time building up partnerships with with uh, stakeholders in. Um, in outside of academia, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment because so that's very interesting. We'll move on now to um, another of your uh, areas of, of interest in your research, pain. Um, now, <laughs> when I uh, was a student at Lancaster, um, I saw you give a talk about your research into language and pain. And um, I, <laughs> it's the only time in my life I've never heard this word before this talk, I've never heard it since, the word lancinating. Um, <laughs> I remember you talking about that word yeah. and, and thinking, okay, maybe there's something that could be done to, to improve uh, the, the, the words that are offered to patients to talk about the pain. That, that's what it's about, right? When, when patients are asked to describe the pain that they're, they're feeling and there's a set of words that they have to kind of, the, 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 the healthcare workers have to sort of offer them, you know, and some of them are so opaque and rare um, tell us about about this sort of work. It's, it sounds so interesting. 
Yeah, so pain is another area where language is really important, especially when the pain is not easy to diagnose and has become chronic. Uh, and mm. it's, chronic pain is very common. I think around the world, about 20, 25% of adults have chronic pain at some point in their lives. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it is very difficult. You know, if you've, if you've got a broken bone and you're in pain, uh, no, no matter how well you communicate or how uh, well the healthcare professionals listen to you, uh, the bone can be fixed. But mm. a lot of pain, it doesn't work like that. Many types of headaches and backache and mm. different kinds of chronic pain don't have an easy, easily identifiable cause. And so then successful communication is really important. Um, but it's not straightforward. And so what you're referring to is uh, a, a questionnaire for the diagnosis of pain called the McGill Pain Questionnaire, mm. which was devised at McGill University in Canada um, in the late uh, 19, 1970s. And that uh, questionnaire, which you can find if you Google it, uh, was revolutionary at the time because it included uh, words offered, like you said, to patients uh, to uh, articulate, to express their pain. So the classic thing, the more traditional thing that is done in pain diagnosis is to say to people, okay, on a scale from one to 10, where one is no pain and 10 is the worst pain you can imagine, how bad is your pain? And that is a way of, of capturing pain intensity. And it's useful, say, if you go to the doctor the first time and you give your pain an eight and then they put you on a course of painkillers and you go back two weeks later and your pain is a three, mm. then you can see how that kind of measure of intensity is uh, useful. Uh, of course, there are issues to do with what, yeah. how bad is the worst pain you can imagine. But anyway, but you can see how it's useful, right? It, it, it plays a role. But that doesn't tell you anything about what the pain feels like. Right, what sometimes mm -hmm. the quality of the pain, what does it actually feel like? And you know, your headache is different from your toothache and from your stomachache, etc. But we have very few words that specialize in pain and they're very generic, like pain, painful, hurt, sore, etc. So that questionnaire was revolutionary because it, it included 78 <laughs> words, such mm -hmm. as sharp and cold and hot and searing and uh, drilling and lancinating, which I'll come back yeah. to. <laughs> and people were presented with groups of words, four or five or six descriptors uh, that all captured the same kind of pain, like whether it's hot or cold or it feels like a sharp object or whatever. And then people had to pick from each group, uh, one descriptor from each group, if that group applied to them. And that questionnaire has become a classic. It's been translated into more than 20 languages. Now it's, there are other versions that are used, but that really was a watershed in terms of actually using words. And in those days, though, corpora didn't exist as such. And so the, it was built on the basis of the clinical experience of the people who devised it, who are major figures in, this, in the study of pain and the treatment of pain. And it was validated by using judges, etc. So it wasn't plucked out of thin air. Mm. However, with 78 descriptors trying to capture the different kinds of pain, and they also were trying to capture intensity, but uh, it, it's not relevant for our discussion now. Some of the words in that questionnaire are very common in English, like hot and cold, mm. and some are very commonly applied to pain, like sharp or tender. But some are, are rare. So uh, the word taught is used, for example. Uh, it's rare in English and rare in relation to pain. Um, and some are ambiguous. So, so the word boring is in there, but it doesn't mean uninteresting. It means to do with pressure. Mm. Uh, but the word that stands out the most is this word lancinating, which actually doesn't exist in English as such, oh. <laughs> except in that questionnaire. So I came across it and... I looked for it, and it's not in any dictionaries. It's not in any uh, corpora, such as the British National Corpus, etc. I found it only in the Oxford English Corpus, which is a corpus consisting of English from around the world. It has about two and a half billion words. And so I thought, oh, there are 15 instances of lancinating in this corpus. So yes. maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it does exist. But then I looked at where it occurs, and it the 15 instances were all uh, art, um, academic articles about that questionnaire. <laughs> so it doesn't have any currency outside. Now, 
Uh, I can see how it came about, and I've never been able to ask the original creators, but the, mm. uh, bear in mind that, the, 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 uh, that question, I was created in, uh, in a bilingual French-English area of Canada, and certainly I know, being an, an Italian native speaker, that one of the ways to describe a really intense pain is the word lancinante. Ah. Right? Lancinating is exactly that. So I suspect that it's some kind of borrowing from a Romance language, possibly French. Um, and, and indeed, it comes from the same root as lancing, et cetera, cutting. So, so it's, but to go back to corpus linguistics, mm -hmm. uh, I came to this questionnaire uh, partly because a doctor, a pain clinician, uh, professor and doctor, Jana Zakshveska, who's a pain specialist who works in London, was concerned that her patients, when presented with the words in the questionnaire, sometimes struggled with them. They struggled to pick, they, they mm. didn't understand. And so what we did with that questionnaire, we uh, took each of the 78 words and looked at how frequent they were in general English, looking at uh, corpora, and also how often they turned up in close proximity to pain. So that we're able to tell the clinicians, and we've written an, a chapter, but we're going to do more work on it very soon. Mm -hmm. So we're able to say, well, these are the words that your patients are likely to find difficult, lancinating being the top one, unless they know a romance language, where maybe they won't <laughs> find it that hard. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yes, and, and I did then have some clinicians in talk saying, oh, that's why they keep telling me, because they become used to it. Mm. But they, that's why they keep telling me they don't know what it means. Uh, because it doesn't exist. But then there are some other uh, cases, less extreme cases, where the word is simply rare mm. in English, and so they may not have to come across it, or it may be rarely used in relation to pain, in which case then uh, there's an issue when people pick uh, words, they might just pick the familiar ones rather than the ones that apply the best. Mm of the creators of the questionnaire. So that is a case of not using, not analyzing what's going on in the corpus, but using the corpus to, if you like, test and compare uh, words that are used in a diagnostic context. And, so, and you, you can see how in future you can start from the corpora instead of ending with the corpora. You know? <laughs> yeah, so you are using really large corpora as massive samples of language yeah. in all sorts of domains and you couldn't find this word apart from in discussions of the pain questionnaire so yeah. just to clarify lancinating that what is the consensus now if if i was uh suffering from some pain and i and they said is it lancinating what does is it a, a cutting sensation is that what it actually means is yeah that it belongs to the cutting group so okay, okay. Yeah, it belongs to the cutting group so in context people may find it easier to understand okay because it is in that group but uh it has no currency mm. you know we can't say it's never used because but what we can say is that there is no evidence of the currency of that word in english mm. um, other than in the questionnaire it may be that it, it has some currency in that part of uh, the world, but there, there's certainly no evidence from dictionaries or corpora that it can be used. And because that questionnaire is used around the world, like my colleague uses it in London, and, and so her patients were struggling with it. So what you did was not to go in and say, we're going to change the questionnaire and change the words, but rather provide additional support to help people interpret the words in the questionnaire as the questionnaire so widely used is that is that the case yeah the questionnaire is a is a classic so it was mm. used for a long time now there are shorter versions of it that don't include all the words and don't include lancinating so uh, uh in, in, it is more a point of reference now than widely mm. used but it's still used uh, yeah, um cool. But what we were able to do uh, as part of the dissemination as well is raise awareness amongst people who might use the questionnaire of where and why patients may struggle. Mm. Uh, and, and that already is a step forward. I mean, we, we, we are about to start a new project and it would be great to produce a questionnaire that is based on corpus evidence in the first mm. place. But obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward enterprise. There are several questionnaires out there and and you know it's important to start from those rather than just trying to invent something new 
immediately, but at least raising awareness is what we've done about the strengths and the weaknesses of the um, questionnaire. And sometimes they knew, it's just that they now yeah. they have evidence as to why. Yeah, they, they feel more empowered to criticize it perhaps because <laughs> linguists yeah. come in and say, well, you're, well, they, you're right. Yeah. You know, this, yeah. Yeah, they know when to, when they have to explain, for example. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, we'll we'll move on to um, something, of course, extremely topical. The last two years, the world has changed in in many ways, and life has changed for so many people. Of course, I'm talking about COVID. Um, who knew that two years on, we'd still be still be going? Um, and and of course, you and and uh, colleagues saw an opportunity to look at the language that people use when they're talking about COVID. Of course, communication about COVID has been such an important part uh, of the response, particularly the way that politicians talk about COVID, but also the press. Um, you've been looking particularly, I, I believe, at metaphorical language, the metaphors that people use when they're talking about COVID, and you're, you're part of an initiative called uh, Reframe COVID. So I wonder if you could just sort of tell us a bit about about this work and um, perhaps some of the concerns you you may you may be had initially about the metaphors that people uh, use to discuss COVID. Yeah, yeah. And so for that, I think I need to go back to uh, March 2020, because maybe it's not just me, but March 2020, in my memory lasted about a year. So I have so many memories of uh, March 2020 that it doesn't feel like a month. It feels much longer. Mm. Um, but anyway, so, so in March 2020, when uh, people began to realize that COVID was going to be a big problem all over the world, um, and, uh, and then the first lockdowns were introduced, um, uh, one of the things that was evident, not just to people interested in metaphor, but it was talked about in the in the media, it was discussed in debates, was the use of metaphor to communicate about the pandemic. And the what seemed to be the dominant metaphor at the beginning was a metaphor to do with the war, that we were the, at war with the coronavirus and the illness, the COVID illness that it caused. Mm. So on... Um, 17th uh, of March uh, 2020, uh, Downing Street released a statement signed by Boris Johnson uh, that said something like, um, uh, coronavirus is an enemy, but it, we, if we fight it, we can beat it. We need to be uh, fighting together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it adopted a framing of fighting of war against the coronavirus. And, uh, and most political leaders around the world did something very similar uh, from, from Italy to China. Trump declared himself a, a wartime president, etc. Mm -hmm. So it was very evident. You didn't need to be uh, a metaphor nerd like my colleagues and I are to mm -hmm. notice that there were these metaphors and the main ones were war metaphors. And, and as I said, there was some pushback right from the beginning about uh, against these metaphors. Um, and so one of the reasons why March 2020 feels long is that I felt a kind of compulsion to, to start researching, even though I was aware, well, I wasn't quite aware how long this thing was going to last. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, because uh, it would have been even worse. Yeah. But I, I had a feeling that something need, we need to do something. We need to do something. Um, uh, and so um, I... Uh, I'm in touch on social media with uh, lots of other researchers and the two in particular, Ines Alza and Paula Sobrino in Spain, um, were tweeting using the hashtag reframe COVID, encouraging people to think beyond uh, war metaphors and to, to, to go beyond war metaphors. Um, we, we already knew that it could be problematic and of course then as I say, people were uh, uh, critiquing them even right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And actually, Ines and Paula were also taking inspiration from the idea of the metaphor menu for cancer. So they were saying, well, war metaphors are there and they'd be used and they're being used. Let's see what alternatives there are. Let's collect them. And so uh, Veronica Collar, who's also from Lancaster and I sort of joined in the conversation and, uh, and we said, okay, it would be good to sort of crowdsource alternatives 
to war metaphors from different languages. And so Veronica mm. created basically a Google document that was open to anybody and uh, with some columns that you had to fill in. And so basically we encourage people via Twitter to, to provide examples of metaphors that were not war metaphors uh, from different languages. And so the thing took off, I mean, you know, in many parts of the world where people would use Twitter for research purposes, people were in lockdown and not really able to concentrate very much uh, on the things that they were supposed to be doing. Yeah. Um, and so it actually took off. It, it also uh, got some attention from the media. So there were media interviews in Spain and, uh, and in the UK, et cetera. So, and we started giving talks almost immediately. Um, so that initiative, yes, was very important. It didn't create a corpus as such, and it created a sort of non-systematic but very rich collection of metaphors. It's still open, but I think most of the contributions were in 2020. And there are more than 500 examples of different kinds of metaphors in about 30 languages contributed by, to, by about 100 people. Wow. And the crucial thing about that uh, collection is that um, it was actually then broken into once, um, and so it needed to be retrieved. So we did have one of those moments. So oh. now it's accessed via Google Form. Yeah, I wasn't involved in that, but yes, the <laughs> colleagues um, uh, who deal with that had, had to retrieve the data at one point because it was hacked or something. Oh. But anyway, it's still there. And the crucial message is that anybody can use it. Uh, you just need to credit it. So the whole idea is that it was crowdsourced. It belonged to everyone. It belongs to everyone. We've written a couple of papers drawing from it, but there's plenty more that could be done with it. Mm. Um, um, and so, yes. And so that in terms of my work on metaphors and COVID, there is reframe COVID. There are, in this particular case, my observations so that I, I uh, collect uh, metaphors as I go along in a, mm -hmm. in a more personal way. Yeah. And then there's a corpus called the coronavirus corpus, uh, which is very large. You can also have basic access for free uh, if you Google coronavirus corpus. And that has news articles in English from different parts of the world from, mm. uh, from January 2020 onwards. And some of my more traditional corpus work on metaphors and COVID has, been, uh, has involved using that. And, and does that work support what people suspected about the, the dominance of war metaphors uh, of COVID? Yes, to some extent. So, um, it, so there is evidence that war metaphors were more frequent at the beginning and then they declined in frequency. Oh, okay. uh, there is a study done using a, um, a natural language processing approach by uh, Mar Mariana Bolognese and Philip Wick. They did two studies which are published um, looking at metaphorical framings. Uh, and at, at the beginning, in early in the, in the early part of the pandemic, they showed how the war framing was more frequent than other framings, such as uh, they have a couple of examples, such as family and others. Mm -hmm. But then they also looked over time, and I think in the second paper they got to summer 2020, and they showed a decline in, in, on Twitter. They looked at Twitter using a, a natural language processing approach. And then I've looked in the coronavirus corpus, this work is not published, but I've looked in the coronavirus corpus at key phrases like war against COVID, fight against COVID, fight against coronavirus, etc. And they do decline. So mm. there's a real cluster at the beginning and they do decline. I've noticed very anecdotally an, a new increase uh, with the Omicron uh, variant coming along and that... You know, it, rem it will remain to be seen whether my impression mm. is is going to be borne out by the data that that there's a kind of renewed sense of battle. So, in terms of frequency, we do have some evidence. They were very mm. frequent at the beginning, and then they started declining. And I think one of the reasons I don't think it's the criticisms as such. I think it's the fact that war metaphors and there's evidence for it prior to the pandemic from psychological research. War metaphors are good at getting people to perceive a problem as serious and urgent. There is evidence of that. So actually, if you set aside your moral objections to war and the fact that then people might get a bit mixed up, that the coronavirus cares about us when in fact it doesn't, if you personify mm -hmm. the coronavirus too much, yeah. you get a bit wrong. But anyway, but there is evidence that they're good for that metaphorical call to arms at the beginning, right? To suggest mm -hmm. something is serious and urgent. But they can also easily then create fatalism and i think the reason why they stopped being used this always being used but less mm. is because 
became clear, this is not going to be a clear victory. Politicians like to re- lead a war that then leads a clear victory that mm-hmm. they can claim. But actually then it's become clear over time and it's even clearer now in, in the, during the Omicron wave mm-hmm. that there isn't going to be a, a moment of victory. No. <laughs> this is going to go on for a long time and then mm-hmm. it's going to turn into some kind of low-level guerrilla war, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> that surfaces every now and again and so then then the whole idea once you are beyond the call to arms stage and you're in the ongoing battle that Mm. is never going to be won in a straightforward way Mm. Uh, you know at the beginning of the pandemic Boris Johnson said we're going to send the coronavirus packing another metaphor in 12 weeks and here we are nearly two years later so then it's less of a of a you know useful rhetorical strategy because we're not winning yeah. And there is never potentially a definitive victory, as you say. No. Um, something I've, I've noticed also anecdotally is um, compared to other variants, for example, the Delta variant, Omicron seems to be framed as a separate entity. I, I don't see people talking about the Omicron variant of COVID, but they just say, oh, Omicron spreading. And COVID doesn't seem to be mentioned as part of it. I, I, I wonder whether there's anything in that. It's something that seems to be different. They didn't seem to talk about the Delta variant in the same way. To me, it was the Delta variant of COVID, whereas Omicron seems to be its own kind of separate thing, maybe because it makes it seem more dangerous. I'm not sure. but um... Yeah, I've noticed the same thing, and I've been, pos- I've been asking the same questions. And I-, I think certainly I've had the same impression. So mm. at the beginning, it was the coronavirus, obviously, mm. and COVID. Uh, initially, the variants, as we all remember, were referred to by the geographical area where they were first identified. So there was the UK variant, the mm-hmm. 10th variant in, in Italian. It was always La Variante Inglese, the English variant. Right. Um, and then there were a couple, there was Beta and Gamma, sort of South African and Brazilian. Mm-hmm. But to begin with, the, the, the letters of the alphabet didn't exist. And then it was, I think, after the Indian variant, which became Delta, that the World Health Organization um, decided to use the Greek alphabet. I think that in linguistic terms, that is a really interesting phenomenon because at the beginning, I was actually skeptical that it would, that it would the, the, the Greek alphabet letters would replace the geographical associations, which of course was leading to stigma against mm. Chinese people, against sometimes British people mm. abroad, uh, um, against people from India, etc. And that really has taken off. I mean, that really mm. has worked, even though the, the link is still there in people's minds. But that really has taken off, uh, which is a good thing. Um, mm-hmm. And and there are clear moments. In fact, when this new variant came along, at the beginning, people called the nu or ni because they thought this would be the next uh, letter of the alphabet that needed to be treated, that needed to be used. And so, oh. were, yeah, no, there were a couple of days. You can still look. There were a couple of days when people started calling it nu. Okay. <laughs> and then I think the World Health Organization, I suspect, because nu is ambiguous with the adjective new mm. uh, they decided to skip new they also skipped another letter for political reasons i won't go into that and so they called it omicron mm. and then within a couple of days it was omicron but i agree that it's been treated partly as a separate um almost like a separate pandemic and to some extent because of the difference from the original coronavirus maybe it sort of is Mm. It does have implications for people building corporate in future because if you want to collect data, you can't just use COVID or coronavirus no. <laughs> because the variants have uh, have you know become uh, the way of referring to to things. Yeah. It will remain to be seen whether, for example, references to COVID etc. decline a bit mm. and Omicron takes off. And yeah. the coronavirus corpus is the place to to go to for that. I think. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, as we uh, we start to wrap up here, um, oh goodness, we talk about this for all day. It's so fascinating. Uh, you, you, you've obviously done so much work, as they call it, applying uh, the, the findings of your work. And we, we've talked about some of those applications. I wonder if you could briefly touch on some of the, the challenges that you, you may have noticed in, as you said earlier, you know, it took several years for you to build up relationships with health practitioners, for instance, um, what are the challenges in, okay, there's one thing which is doing the research and noticing something about language and going, oh, isn't that interesting? It's another thing to actually, you know, present that to the world and have people notice and go, oh, okay, I'm going to change something based on what you recommend. 
for you, what are, what are the challenges in in making that leap from doing the research to applying the research? Yeah, so th there is a challenge at the start to um, to uh, find collaborators and build a track record. And I really want to emphasize that because I think if people look at me now, they think, oh, it's easy for her, right? She's got all <laughs> these contacts and she's got all. Yeah. But the thing is, it took years and years of uh, work and of sort of persistence. I've actually written a chapter about my experience that was probably going to come out next year. Um, sort of showing how it's a combination of sort of, you know, perseverance, luck and a bit of serendipity that mm -hmm. you then find people to work with. Um, so the crucial thing is be persistent, be humble, uh, be open. And uh, and people will you will find people who uh, will become good colleagues from outside linguistics so that you can reach different audiences and be aware of questions such as to do with the that pain questionnaire that are bothering clinicians. And now the door is more open, more of us are doing this. And so I think I think the field has more, uh, it's, been, it's been going for some time, especially in areas like conversation analysis, but I think there's much more awareness now of the potential of corpus methods. And not just because of my work, but that of others at Nottingham, other people at Lancaster, et cetera, uh, who, who have been working in these areas. But, but don't be, you know, don't be, if you're starting out, uh, mm -hmm. don't feel uh, despondent if things don't work out immediately. But then in terms of the applications, again, it's a matter of kind of doing things and believing in things, even if the rewards don't come out, don't come immediately. So the metaphor menu, spend time in a sort of half living, half dead state for a long time. <laughs> I didn't have time to, you know, make it look nice so that it could be dead. Um, and then, you know, the funding ended and I had other things to do. And then there was an opportunity, a colleague from healthcare said, oh, why don't we launch it? There was a social science festival. Why don't we get some funding to launch it properly? And we did at the end of 2019, actually. So we had some in-person events and that's when it properly took off. But um, but it took it took years. And there was a point when I thought, oh, maybe it's not going to work, etc. So it requires persistence. The other thing that I've had to realize is that you've got to have at some point, a compromise, you've got to decide for yourself um, whether you want, you're going to want to privilege control of what happens with your findings or whether you want to privilege the potential reach and then you don't know what's happening. Let me explain mm -hmm. what I mean quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so with a metaphor menu, I honestly do not know how far it's gone. And the reason is that not only did we launch it uh, in in in-person events where I knew who was there and I could yeah. contact them. But then anybody who wanted physical copies uh, sent, you know, I said, email me or, and I sent versions of the metaphor menu to many parts of the world. And I said to people, please let me know if you use it. But then people don't have time yeah. to let me yeah. know. But then it's available to download. And the page, I haven't looked recently, but the last time I looked, that page had been accessed about three and a half thousand times. So I do not actually, some people leave feedback, but I don't mm. actually know how far it's gone. And sometimes I found myself, I was giving a talk in, at the University of Bangor and somebody who was there, she said, oh, my mom work in a works in a hospice, they use your menu. I had no clue. <laughs> so so the, the, but the thing is, I decided not to have control. Anybody can download it. Um, but it, what it means is that when I have to sort of say how far has it gone, I kind of have a very hazy idea. But mm. I'd rather have it that way. I could have control, right? I could have said, if you want it, email me. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I send it to you on the condition mm. that you know exactly what happens. But then fewer people would have used it. Mm. So, and this has happened with some other aspects of my research that sometimes you've got to say okay I will run the risk of not knowing exactly what's going on and not being able to document things fully but that might mean that the thing reaches more people the Cancer Research UK link I have no clue how many people access it mm. so that is a, another decision and then the other thing of course is the obvious thing make sure that when you interact with people you interact in a language that that is appropriate to them not necessarily appropriate to you uh but that actually is not that hard and i think mm. we as as a community of linguists we become much better at doing that yeah yeah absolutely Th thank you that's that's 
really fascinating insight. Um, we're going to wrap up now with three quick fire questions, although um, linguists don't tend to be good at uh, quick answers to quick fire questions. We'll see how you do. Um, okay. Here we go. What is the biggest change you've noticed in corpus research throughout your career? Oh, it's definitely the applications outside linguistics. I mean, that's an easy one. There's no question about that. There, there were applications to kind of content analysis in industry early on, but the range of areas where that corpus linguistics reaches now is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is definitely that change. Other people might be able to give an answer more on the technical side, but mm -hmm. certainly from my experience, that that has been the biggest change. Yeah. Of course, the corporate are bigger, the tools yeah. are better, but the applications um, yeah. and, and the fact that people know about it outside linguistics too is crucial. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, what has surprised you the most about your own work in corpus linguistics? Um, well, two things, I guess. One is how um, I've been, a how that training in the linguistic study of literature has actually been irrelevant all along. So I've been yeah. looking at metaphors for 30 years. Yeah. And now I use corpus methods and I look at metaphors in you know, relation to pain or cancer or COVID. Mm. But actually, uh, in, in some cases, corpus linguistics enables you to do better and on a larger scale the things you were always interested in. Mm. So... Um, that is definitely the case. The more linguistic communicative type fun finding that was all surprised me is, well, there are actually two things. One is wherever I look, uh, there is humor, even if we don't look for it. So okay. there's lots of humor in the cancer data. Hmm. And the other one is that it's, there's always conflict as well, because I look at online data. So uh, politeness and impoliteness always come into the picture as well so and we usually don't set out to look for them and then we find humor and conflict amongst um, other okay one more <laughs> um how will corpus linguistics make an impact on the world in the future well i think we're on the way there already because mm -hmm. uh corpora will be larger they will be more accessible to anyone they already are in the corpus that you contributed to create when you were at Lancaster, the spoken British national corpus is available to people. So people will use them more in schools, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it will become, it has already become less a, a kind of an established thing that people do, not something that a small number of people do, mm -hmm. but that uh, a lot of people do. So I think that is definitely the case. But also, and maybe we can talk about it another time, one of the things that happens to me as director of the Center for Corpus Approaches to Social Science is that I get approached on a regular basis by different kinds of organizations, especially charities, who say, I am concerned about topic X. Mm. And I, I, we have a hunch about how it's used in the media, whatever, but we want to really know, can you help us? And so they come, they come to us. We don't go looking for them. So wow. it's, it's clear that the, the, the method already has currency um, outside. And so I think and that does contribute to change things and make things better. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And we will bring this episode to to an end so um Eleanor thank you so much that was a, a really you. interesting and fun conversation despite the subject matter that we've covered um so yes thank you very much to Eleanor Semino from Lancaster University for being such a, a brilliant guest here on Corpus Cast and um as you our a uh, humble and loyal viewer um if you wish to find out more about what's happening um at Aston University with Corpus Linguistics you can follow the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus. But for now, we'll bring this episode to a close. So, Elena Semino, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.